Hello, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, good night, or whenever you're watching this video. Um, let's see, I must be in. So, um, I hope you enjoyed part one of this video on um, pie, Buckingham Pie Charms. And for part two of lesson eight, um, we are going to continue this material as before. This isn't, we're going to be working through the material in section 7.3 of the text, and we have a few learning objectives. First, I wish to apply linear equations to determine Buckingham Pi, uh, determine Buckingham Pi terms, and second, use Pi, uh, use uh, Pi terms, uh, or determine Pi terms uh, using both linear equ equations and inspection techniques. So, in the previous video, we mainly found our Pi terms using um, using what we would call inspection techniques, where we were just sort of uh, really trial and error until we could make something that was a um, a dimensionless term, but there's a better way, uh, a more systematic approach that will be useful, especially if you have more complicated pi terms, more um, more repeating variables, etc, etc. So, alright, and with that, let's begin. So, let's look at, the, basically what I'm going to teach you is the idea of using linear equations to solve for um, Buckingham pi terms. So let's go back to dimensional analysis. Dimensional analysis. And we are going to look at linear the method of linear equations. Linear equations. Now at first you might think, well what what do linear equations possibly have to do with pi terms? I and mean, we saw last time that we were dealing with things that weren't linear at all. They were cl clearly um, things such as uh, one variable multiplied or divided by another. They didn't look linear at all. Um, well, we've got to be careful which linear terms we're talking about. Uh, and so, well, you'll see what I'm talking about. We're, we're working more with uh, the exponents and forming equations based on the exponents, et cetera, et cetera, which we shall see. Which we shall, which we shall see. mind, I just can't talk. Okay, so um, let us consider the general form of an equation if we have three reference dimensions and five variables. So look at the general form. So for a system, let's say um, we have, let's look at the general form of a system that had um, r equals three reference dimensions. Um, reference dimensions R equals three reference dimensions and K equals five variables. Let's see how the system would develop. Okay, so in general our pi, uh, we're going to have pi one and pi two. If you remember, the number of pi terms is going to be equal to k minus r. So we're going to need two different pi terms. And in general, they're going to be something like this. a1 uh, to the x1, a2 to the y1, a3 to the z1, and a4. and a4. Pi 2 is going to be something like a1 to the x2, a2 to the y2. So I'm just going to write this and then I'll explain what the, what the heck all this stuff means. a2 to the y2, a3 to the y3, or a2, a3 to the z2 I should say. Got to be very careful with our labels. And then a5. So each of these capital letter A's is a variable. And notice we don't have powers on these. And the reason for that is because these are our independent, or are our, um, not independent, sorry, are, these are our non-repeating variables. These are our non-repeating variables. Hmm. 
Meanwhile, a1, a2, and a3, these are our repeating variables. So these are going to um, these are going to occur to a certain power. In other words, we're going to have these a1 is going to have a certain power, a2 is going to have a certain power, and that power is going to be different in each of the pi terms. That's why we have an x1 and an x2, a y1, a y2, etc. And this, the value of this exponent has to be an integer. It has to be, uh, it could be 1, 2, 3, 4, negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, et cetera, et cetera. But um, if, it's, and if it's a negative exponent, it's going to appear in the denominator. If it's a positive exponent, it's going to appear in the numerator of the pi term. And we get different co exponents depending on what is needed for that particular pi term. And so basically what we're going to do is, we are going to solve for exponents such that units cancel out. That's going to be our approach. Approach, uh, solve for exponents, um, solve for the exponents, uh, such that the units cancel out. Such that units cancel. Okay, so let's see what we mean by this. Well, if we remember from previous uh, from the previous video, if we remember from our previous video, then we're going to continue with that example from um, the previous video. We remember we had a delta P L. Again, a drop in pressure per unit length that was a function of d rho d rho mu and v and v we had repeating vari we had a few repeating variables and our non repeatings and the power on the non repeatings you will remember is always going to be 1 so we don't have to solve for those thankfully makes our job just a little bit easier. And non-repeating. So we had our repeating variables, which we had diameter, which has uh, dimensions of L. We have rho, which has dimensions of m, L to the negative 3. And we have velocity v, which has dimensions or units, depending on how you want to conceptualize it, as lt to the negative 1. And our non-repeating, which will only appear once, um, was going to be delta pl. And remember, our final dependent variable, our, del our final dependent variable, our delta pl in this case, will always be um, a non-repeating variable. Our, our dependent variable will always be a non-repeating variable. So um, here, m l to the negative 2, t to the negative 2, <clears throat> and our viscosity mu is going to have units or dimensions of m l to the negative 1, t to the negative 1. All right, so I'm going to do, I'm going to work through these and uh, see what happens to the dimensions. So let's look at this here. Okay. All right. Um, now, pi 1 is going to be, if I substitute these terms in, it's going to be d x to the 1, rho y to the 1, v z to the 1, and delta PL. And again, this is going to be uh, power 1. That's why it doesn't have its own um, exponent variable here. And then this is going to have um, this is going to have dimensions. Okay. So we're going to have L for length uh, to the x1 power. That comes from the diameter. We're going to have M L to the negative 3 
to the y1, and this comes from the row, the density. Then we're going to have lt to the negative 1, which is just uh, length over time, or in other words, velocity. Distance over time. To the z1. Uh, to the z1, divided by m, l to the negative 2, t to the negative 2. And this it comes from our um, delta pl. And this has to equal L1 or L to the 0, getting a little ahead of myself, M to the 0, T to the 0. This must fundamentally be a dimensionless term. So what that means is that ultimately the L, the M, and the T all must come, all must have a power of 0 once all of these are multiplied together. And we are going to use this to form linear equations using our rules of power, addition, and subtraction. So the second pi term, pi 2, um, let's see, so let's look at our second pi term. Um, so if we scroll up here, pi 2 is, are like, the, are like these. And so our second pi term is going to have um, the same repeating variables, except this time it's going to have mu there for our, um, for our uh, non-repeating variable. So it's going to be d times x2 times rho time, uh, to the y2 times v to the z2 times mu. Now if I plug in, um, if I plug in or substitute in my, uh, my dimensions again, I'm going to get l to the x2 times ml to the negative 3 to the y2 to the y2 times, finally, our lt to the negative 1 uh, to the z2. Then multiplied by the dimensions of the mu, the viscosity. m l to the negative 1, t to the negative 1. This is equal to 1, or simply l naught, m naught, T naught. All right. <clears throat> so let's see. Now, to be dimensionless, this has to meet certain criteria. So let's consider this for a moment. Let's see. So let's scroll down here. Now, to be dimensionless, these must, multiply, these must multiply together to be one. In other words, each unit, each individual dimension or each individual unit must multiply together to be one. So let me just put that as a note even. So to be dimensionless, to be dimensionless, each unit must multiply to one. In other words, I can say, look at the, let's, let's look at every term that has an L in it. So L, x to the 1, times L, so that we have this one, we have this x1 here for this L. Um, I have this, if you remember the rules of dealing with powers from your days in um, Algebra 2, you can look here, we, we know that, of course, that when we distribute the when we, when we distribute a power down, we'll get negative 3y, this is just elementary math, negative 3y1, that's coming from here, uh, times l to the z1, l to the z1, times l to the negative 2 to the negative 2, and that comes from this here, there's no variable there, just the, um, just the L itself. And this must come to L0. Now, we know something about how powers combine. We can apply another power rule, and that is when we, when we multiply different terms together with the same base, we simply add the powers. 
And so this, this same relationship must hold true. And from this, we can get the linear equation x1 minus 3y1 plus, oh, and I should have a z1 here, uh, plus z1 minus 2 equals 0. All right, now let's look at this here. So next, let me look at, um, so I'm going to have this. Now let me look at the m. I'm going to have m to the y1, and then m just to the first power. And this must equal m to the 0. And from this, again, I'm going to transform the powers into linear equations. I get that y1 plus 1 is equal to 0. And then, looking at the t's on this first pi term, I can say that, um, well, let's see, t to the negative z1, and that comes from this one here, right here, sorry, right here, t to the negative z1, and then times t to the negative 2 equals t to the 0. And this transforms then, I can, this can then be used to create the linear equation negative z1 um, minus 2 equals 0. And now it's fairly straightforward to just solve a system of linear equations. Now these ones are actually especially trivial because they're just, um, because I can clearly get from this one that this will clearly lead to z1 equals negative 2. This one leads to y1 equals negative 1. And if I combine both of these together, I will get that x1 is equal to 1. So um, I now know, I now know the powers that go into these expression, uh, into this expression here. So I now know that pi 1 is equal to d times rho to the negative 1 uh, times v to the negative 2 times delta pl. Or pi 1, then, is equal to the diameter, that uh, looks like a really bad d, to the, it is equal to the diameter times delta pl, which again is the pressure loss per unit length, over rho v squared. And that is the same pi term that I got in the previous video from inspection. Alright, so um, we can do the same, and let's do the same for the second pi term going to be the same. It's going to be a very similar process, and hopefully not um, too concerning. So pi 2, I can look at the second pi term. And let's see. Well, if I apply what I know already, I'm going to have L x2. Um, L so if I look at the L's for the second pi term um, right here, <clears throat> this basically I'm just going to distribute these down to the, to the um, constituent dimensions, and then set up equations based on length, um, mass, and time. So uh, L x2 times L to the negative 3 y2 times L to the z2 times L to the negative 1 equals L to the 0. And from this one, from the length equation, I can get that x2 minus 3y2 plus z2 minus 1 equals 0. From the mass, from the mass dimension, I can get m y2 times m1 Again, that comes from just up here, just distributing down the y2 to the m, and the 1 to the m, etc., etc., or m to the 1, etc., and this equals m to the 0 power, and this can go to create the equation y2 plus 1 equals 0, and then finally t, I can get t 
to the negative z2 times t to the negative 1 equals t to the 0. And this will lead to the equation, the linear equation, negative z2 minus 1 is equal to 0. And if you combine all these together, apply a very simple algebra, we'll find that x2 is equal to 1, y2 is equal to negative 1, and z2 and z2 is also equal to negative 1. Okay? And so from this, I now know that the pi term um, is going to be pi 2 is equal to d to the, to the first, rho to the negative 1, v to the negative 1 times mu. Or put in fraction form, um, pi 2 is equal to mu over rho d v. Or I could also express this, it's also just as, it's also just as valid to use pi 2 equals rho dv over mu. Because these are dimensionless, it really shouldn't matter whether you use one or the other. Okay, so what I'd like to do is I would like to work through an example, and um, we're doing pretty good time-wise. So I want to work through another example um, in solving for pi terms using the method of linear equations that we've seen here. Okay. So let me give myself some room to work here. All right, so moving on to an example. So consider this example here. Um, this example is going to be looking at, say, uh, the height of waves and the various and the various um, inputs or the various variables that go into determining the height of waves for a particular coastline or for a particular low. I shouldn't say for a particular coastline, for a particular location um, at a certain distance from the coast. So let's say you have a sh uh, sea bottom here. And then you have some waves, great, wonderfully well-drawn waves, like these. Then I'm going to have a, what I'm going to call D. L is going to be something like this. L, then maybe this is our H here. And then maybe I have a V here. So I am given the following. I am given the following variables that will go into finding um, the determining the height of a wave under given conditions. So this is our dependent variable, wave height. Um, v is the wind speed. Um, rho A uh, Rho A is going to be the density of air. The density of air. Uh, D is going to be the water depth. The water depth. Um, L is going to be the distance to shore. The distance to shore. G is going to be the acceleration due to gravity. Um, rho is going, and finally, rho, not rho A, but just rho, is going to be the water. Um, density. Oh boy, look at this. This is going to be fun. We got all sorts of variables here. 
Got all sorts of variables here. So um, I am told also, um, this is all part of the same given, that h is a function of v rho a d l g and rho. I am also told to use uh, to use uh, d, v, and rho as repeating variables. As repeating variables. So in this particular problem, they actually just told us what variables to use as repeating variables, so we don't have to worry about um, sorting those out first. Hint, hint, if I'm a... Uh, well, if, you know, if you're wanting to know how to study for the exam, well, at least, well, not the one you're preparing for now, but for the next one, um, the one that this one, will, this material will be on, um, well, you know, when I'm grading exams, I like to make sure there's, you know, one correct answer at the end of it, so, you know, on an exam problem, I probably would actually give you the, um, repeating variables, uh, just so that way everyone can come up with the exact same, uh, set of final pi terms. But anyway, so I'm given all this nonsense, and I am asked to find, I am tasked with finding uh, pi terms to describe problem. To describe the problem. Find the pi terms to describe the problem. So, <laughs> behold, yes we have, again, and this is a re fairly realistic scenario. We have um, waves of a certain height, and look at the various variables that go into this. Wind speed, density of air, water depth, distance to shore, gravity, acceleration due to gravity, etc. These are all fairly, um, just kind of the usual spe suspects for what you would kind of think would go in to determining the properties of wave heights. So, let's see here. Give myself some room to work with here, and we're good. Okay, so now let me work through this. Let's work through the solution. Solution. All right, so again, I know that h is going to be a function of, of v rho a um, d let me make sure I used a, yep, D again. In the previous problem, D was, di uh, was diameter for a pipe. This one is for the depth of the water. D, L, G, and rho. All right, so let's look at our, um, let us first go and see how many pi terms we need. And in order to do that, I need to, l I need to go and list out all of the fundamental um, uh, dimensions of our terms here, and the book does in the uh, does have a fairly good um, uh, does have a nice table uh, listing the various um, dimensions of some common quantities. So you might want to look for that. Okay, so h wave height that's just going to be l um, v that's our velocity. We've done we've seen that guy before. L t to the negative one. Row A, that's, that's density, that's, well, it's density of air, but it's still density. It's going to have dimensions of M, L to the negative 3. Depth, that's just like going, going to be just like wave height, units of L. Length, well, <laughs> well, distance to shore, not length. But yes, L will obviously have units of length. G is acceleration, so that's going to be meters per second squared. Or L, T to the negative 2 and rho, just another density, m l to the negative 3. Now, um, let's find the number of reference dimensions. Well, just right off the bat, I see l, t, and m. So I know that I'm going to have r equals 3 reference dimensions. Then, looking at my um, variables here, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, let's see, 
One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Huh. I have seven variables. So I have k equals seven variables, or variables. So then, the number of pi terms is simply k minus r. equals k minus r equals 7 minus 4, or 7 minus 3, getting ahead of myself, equals 4 pi terms. So what I'm going to ultimately end up with is probably something like pi 1 is equal to some function, and uh, in later lessons we'll learn about actually, we'll learn to how to actually find this function. Right now we're just finding the pi terms. Is some function of pi 2, pi 3, and pi 4. So it's going to be some function of these four pi terms. Pi 1 is going to be our uh, pi term for our dependent variable. So this will be the one for the wave height. So what we've managed to do here is we, we can't um, simplify it quite as much as, as we did the previous one, but we still whittled um, seven variables down to four pi terms, which does make experimentation much easier and simpler. So, I want to, let's see here, well, I am trying to make the cursor go back here, that's fine, oh well, whatever, that's fine too. Okay, so we were again told, use D, V, and rho as repeating variables. So we do need to actually check the criteria from before. So let's check criteria. So if you remember the criteria from previously, check the criteria. For the repeating variables, if you look back to the previous video, that we have two criteria for our repeating variables. First, they must not include the dependent variable. Second, um, all reference dimensions must be present. All reference dimensions must be present. So let's think about that. So let me analyze these. Well, it doesn't include the dependent variable. We're good there. H not included. And then let's check this. Well, D has the units of L or dimensions of L, V has dimensions of L, T to the negative 1, and Rho has dimensions of M, L to the negative 3. So again, we are good. We have all three of our reference dimensions. Alright, so M, L, T present, so we're good. And it should be obvious that we couldn't use, say, row A and row um, both, as, uh, both as repeating variables because they can clearly cancel each other out. They're dependent on each other. Uh, well, they could clearly cancel out in a way that's dimensionless. Okay, so we're going to use linear equations, and we're going to set up... Uh, I'm going to work through these one by one, setting up linear equations for each of them. So, let's just roll on through it. Well, I know, let's, let's, so let's start at the obvious one, and we'll start at pi 1. The rest is just kind of plug, plug and chug. Well, pi 1, pi 1 is going to equal d times x to the 1, or not x to the 1, just x1, um, times v to the y1, 
times uh, rho to the z1 times h. And this is then equal to L. Um, oh, that doesn't look right. So um, again, first I write out the general form, and then I substitute in the dimensions of each of these variables and uh, distribute the appropriate, um, the appropriate exponents. So if I do that, if I plug in, um, if I plug this in, if I plug in the dimensions for d, I get L to the x1 times L t to the negative 1 to the y1 times ml to the negative 3 to the z1 times L. And this, of course, must equal m to the 0, L to the 0, t to the 0. Then I set up uh, linear equations based on each of the dimensions. So for L, I get x1 plus y1, the x1, the y1, etc., uh, minus 3z1 uh, plus 1 and that's this L here equals 0. Um, for m, well, I'm going to get that, um, let's see, the only two things where I have an m are just this, the only one where I have m is this one here, so all I have is simply z1 equals 0. Oh, that made things easy. And for t, well, look, the only one with the t is this one. So um, I get negative y1 equals 0. And so this quickly collapses into x1 is equal to negative 1, z1 is equal to 0, and y1 is equal to 0. If I put those into a pi term, I get that pi1 is simply equal to h over d. So notice our rho and our um, v actually completely drop away. Um, we can see here that even though we set them up for, uh, in, even though we uh, set these pi terms up assuming every variable will be present, um, in certain cases they do drop out because they have a power of zero. Pi one in this case is h over d. And that's the pi term for, that's gonna be the pi term for our dependent variable. Next, I want to look at pi 2. Next, I'm going to look at pi 2. So for pi 2, pi 2 is equal to d to the x2 times v to the y2 times rho to the z2 times rho a. And again, notice we have, so do notice the construction of this. We're going to have each of the, in the uh, each of the repeating variables to some unknown power, to some unknown power times one of the non-repeating variables. So if I just plug in the dimensions, I get times, it, I get that this is going to be uh, L to the x2 times L t to the negative 1 to the y2, uh, not 1 over 2, but y2, I just can't write, times m L to the negative 3 z2 times m L to the negative 3. And this equals m0, l0, t0. So then l, if I go through and find the, set up the linear equations based upon this, well if I look at l, this term, this term, this term, and this term each have an l, so that'll all go into the equation. Um, for l, I get a very hectic equation of x2 plus y2 um, minus 3z2 
minus 3 equals 0. And um, the examples we've worked through so far are, fa are fairly simple in their algebra. But if you did get, say, say you got three equations that each had a non-zero x, y, z, etc., you would, could just use it using, you could solve it using um, matrix tech, you could solve it using um, row operations, you could solve it using algebra, or you can solve it by um, inverting the matrix, etc., etc. Um, then if I set up an equation for the m, I'm going to get that z2 plus 1 equals 0. Oh, I cannot write. z2 plus 1 equals 0. And finally for t, I'll get that negative y2 is just equal to 0. There's only one term with a, there's only one term with a t in it, and that's this one here. With m, there are two terms with an m in it, this one and this one. So this will combine together to get that x2 is equal to 0, z2 is equal to negative 1, and y2 is equal to 0. So from this, I find that by um, if I plug in the appropriate powers, I will find that, oh, look here, x2 is 0, so that means the d term will drop away, y2 is 0, so that means the row will drop away, and so I simply get that pi2 the second pi term is equal to rho A over rho, the density of air over the density of water. Next, I'll find pi 3. So next, I will find the third pi term. For pi 3, well, let's see. I can say that pi 3 is equal to dx3 uh, vy3 vy3, oh my goodness, I cannot write tonight. vy3 rho z3 uh, times L. And this is equal to L times x to the x3. Again, I just gave them uh, an x, y, and z, and all of them have 3 because this is a subscript of 3 because this is the third pi term. L to the x3 times, again, all I'm doing here is substituting in the dimensions for each of these quantities, each of these variables. L t to the negative 1 uh, y3 times m l to the negative 3 to the z3 times l. And this, of course, equals m to the 0, l to the 0, t to the 0. I set up my equations. l, m, and t, one for each. I get the x3, so you should be a pro at this by now. x3 plus y3 minus 3z3 minus 3z3 plus 1 equals 0, and then z3 equals 0, and negative y3 is equal to 0. Combine these all together, I get that x3 is equal to negative 1, z3 is equal to 0, and y3 is also equal to 0. So, plugging in the appropriate powers, I get that pi3 is equal to L over D. Finally, let us find the fourth pi term. The fourth pi term, pi 4, and as a reminder for each of these, notice what I'm doing. I have the three independent variables, each assuming a power, and then there are, sorry, not three independent variables, sorry, the three repeating variables, each to an unknown power, times a non-repeating variable. So, uh, notice, each of these pi terms is going to have d, v, and rho to an unknown power, but then they'll have whatever um, non-repeating variable uh, needs to be for that particular pi term. So, pi 4, then, is going to be of the form 
pi 4 equals d to the x4, uh, v to the y4, rho to the z4, times g, equals l to the x4, times, uh, again, now I'm just plugging in the dimensions of each of these terms, times lt to the negative 1 to the y4, times m l to the negative 3 to the z4, times lt to the negative 2. Um, and then this is going to be equal to, and there's no power on this again because this is the non-repeating variable, g. m0, l0, t0. I'll set up equations for each of the dimensions, m, l, and t. And I get x3 plus y3 minus 3z3 plus 1 equals 0. z3 equals 0 and negative y3 is equal to 0. To combine these together, I get that x3 equals negative 1. Oh wow, I... I wrote, I, let's see, that's not right solve these and we get that oh man I'm sorry here I wrote the wrong equations here apologize for that I hate it when that happens okay let me fix this properly the correct equations here I need to be less on uh, I need to pay, pay I need to be paying more attention I guess okay so L here let's look at this properly this time is going to be x4 plus y4 minus 3z4 plus 1 is equal to 0. Next, uh, and this one comes from this the L here, the LX to the 4, the Y4L, and the negative 3z4 plus 1 equals 0. M, I just get that z4 is equal to 0, and um, for T, negative negative uh, y4 minus 2 equals 0. And now if I combine all these together, I'll get the, uh, the correct values. x4 equals 1, z4 equals 0, and y4 equals negative 2. Put this all together, and I will plug, in, plug them in for the appropriate powers here, uh, and rearrange the term. I get the pi4 is equal to d g over v squared. And this would be our fourth pi term. Or, if I really wanted to combine all this, I could say, if I wanted to summarize, I could say here, thus, um, h over d, h over d, is going to be some function of row A over row, comma L over D, comma G D over V squared. And I have reduced, and notice what I've done, I have gone and reduced um, seven variables to four. Now this will still be a fairly complicated problem to solve, but still, could be a, still going to be a lot simpler than the um, than a seven variable system. All right, so I think I'll work through one more example. I think I have time for that. We can make that work. So I have one more example, and then we'll call it a night. And this one's going to look at bubbles. Yes, bubbles. Okay, so consider this for a moment. Let's say I am given the relationship delta p is some unknown function of r and sigma, where these are defined as delta p is excess uh, pressure inside a bubble, inside a bubble,
r is the bubble radius. And sigma is the surface tension. And I am asked to find a few things. Find A, um, what happens to delta P to delta P, the excess pressure in a bubble, if R doubles, and B, same, similar thing, what happens to delta P if sigma doubles? Hmm. At first, this seems like a rather intractable problem, but this can actually be solved with simple dimensional analysis. Now, we haven't actually talked about finding the functions relating to pi terms, but as we'll see for this particular problem, it's, it's rare that you can do this on pi term problems, you usually have to actually get a data set and experiment and get a data set and correlate um, the relationship between pi terms. But as we'll see, this will actually work out pretty neatly. This one works better than um, most in that I actually don't need to get data set. And you'll see why. To at least have a, a generic relationship. So, um, you know what? I've been using MLT the whole time. I think. Why don't I try using the FLT system? FLT, not to be confused with FTL, which is something different entirely. So let's try using the FLT system. So um, just like before, and always, I'm going to start by um, finding my number of pi terms. So I'm going to write out the dimensions of each of my variables. Uh, delta P is pressure, so that's going to be force per unit area, or F L to the negative 2. R, radius, has units of length, like meters, centimeters, whatever, so its dimension is just L. And sigma has dimensions of F L to the negative 1. So, um, here... All of this combines together to produce a few things. Well, first let's look at the k. Well, k is just the number of variables. That's fairly straightforward. k is going to be equal to 3. <clears throat> now let's find the number of reference dimensions. I have f, l, and no time whatsoever. So r is equal to 2. So this means I need k minus 1. Um, k minus, sorry, oh, not k minus 1, k minus r equals 1 pi term. For this, I'm only going to have 1 pi term. How is that going to work? How do I, how can I, how is that going to work? How can I have a function with just one variable? Seems odd, huh? Well, um, because that wouldn't be possible, that normally you couldn't have a function like that if you just had a single variable. But remember, each pi term is made of multiple variables, so we actually can do this. So I can say that pi 1 is simply going to be equal to some unknown constant. Now, to actually find that constant, I would need some uh, data sets. I would need a set of data, but um, to find the relationships like to find relationships like these, what happens to delta P if R doubles, etc., I don't actually need to know that constant. But if I were asked to find the exact delta P for a given R and uh, sigma, then I would need the um, then I would need that constant, and I would need a data set to um, correlate it. And we'll be talking about that in the next lecture. So pi one is a constant. Now, so this shouldn't take too long. We only have one pi term to worry about. So, in general, let's see here. Oh. Let's see if I can make this work. Okay. So, um, I know that pi 1 is going to be a function of, well, it's going to be something like delta p 
times RA uh, times sigma B. Now, how did I know that? Let's see. Well, somewhat that was just a guess. I mean, we weren't told what the, non, what the repeating variable would be, what the non-repeating variable would be, but we only need our repeating variables. We need our repeating variables. So we could pick really either of these as the, um, the non-repeating variable. But for convenience, let's just let uh, delta P be the non-repeating variable. Although with certain ability, all of these are going to be non-repeating variables because none of we only have one pi term. Again, we're going to need R repeating variables, so that means there's going to be two. Um, uh, so that, that means for since we have R of two, we'll have two um, repeating variables. Okay, so moving along, I can say plugging in. So let me just you know let's let me go ahead and label this delta P. This is my non-repeating. And these will be my repeating. My repeating. So um, plugging in, plugging these in, I can get that pi one equals f l to the negative two times l to the a. And I'm just giving, I just gave these, uh, now in the previous examples I've been working through x1, x2, x3, etc. Uh, don't be too, conf don't be uh, alarmed by this a and b. Since we only had one pi term, I was just feeling lazy, so I just put an a and a b there instead of the um, x1, x2, since we don't need to, dist we don't need to distinguish between multiple um, pi terms exponents. Times f l to the negative 1 to the b. And this is going to be equal to f to the 0, l to the 0. Now I set up a few equations based upon this. f, I get 1 plus b. Again, that just comes from the different terms that have a f in it. And I can rather quickly surmise that b is equal to negative 1. And then l, looking at l, well, I have this negative 2, a, and the b term negative 2 plus a minus b is equal to 0. And I can find, once I know that b equals negative 1, I can plug that one in and find that a is equal to 1. So now just uh, putting in the appropriate powers and setting up the fraction, I can find, or setting up the quotient, I can find that pi 1 is just delta p r over sigma. And um, so delta P R over sigma. And this is just going to be equal to some constant. So I can then use this to answer the original question. So A, um, if R doubles, so just now that this is fixed at a constant, P, delta P times R over sigma, if R doubles, um, well, let's see. We are considering that, um, let's think about that. So if R is going to double here, what will happen to, um, what will happen to our, um, delta P? Assuming, of course, that everything else holds constant. So we know that delta P, um, is this. So actually, let's go back and solve for delta P. So I'm going to take this and solve for delta p, and let's just say this, let's this constant equals c. So delta p then is equal to c sigma, c sigma over r. So this means that if r doubles, then delta p reduce, is reduced by half. So I took my pi term, set it equal to a constant c, and then just solved for my, de my uh, delta p. Reduced by half. That would be my answer for part a and b, using the same equation. If sigma doubles, then clearly delta p 
doubles. Because if sigma is doubling, then and everything else is hold, held constant, then delta p will also double. All right, and that is a brief introduction to pi terms. Um, or actually, the uh, previous lesson was a brief introduction to pi terms. This was just finishing that introduction up. Um, we have now seen how to find the exponents or the, um, yes, the powers inside pi terms for the various variables in a very systematic and logical manner. And in the previous lesson, we learned just what pi terms were and what they described and their purpose. And the next one we'll be looking at, um, in the next lesson, we will be looking at how to correlate data to pi terms. And then later lessons, we'll be looking at similitude and some other advanced concepts. All right, that'll do it for this evening. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to see me during my office hours or before or after class. Um, and as always, thank you.